All right, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, yeah, so this talk is about eigenvarieties. So I wanted to start with a little bit of background on, uh, on the development of the subject. So I guess uh, the idea, very generally speaking, is that we want to keep track of uh, p power congruences between coefficients of automorphic forms. And Hida, around 1980 or so, was uh, the first person to suggest that you might do this by constructing p-adic analytic families of p-adic modular forms. So he did this in a special case, and then the study of this was taken up by Coleman and Mazur in the 1990s. And this, uh, and then they had this paper in 1998 um, where they constructed the first eigencurve, which is a rigid analytic curve uh, whose points are in bijection with piatic modular forms, um, and specifically piatic modular forms that are Hecke eigenforms. So as I said, this is this is uh, the original Eigen curve. Um, and uh, and uh, modular forms being just automorphic forms on GL2. It makes sense that since then, uh, many that many um, other authors have constructed eigenvarieties uh, parameterizing automorphic forms, Hecke eigenforms for automorphic forms on other groups. And so the particular case that I wanted to talk about today uh, was first constru constructed by Chenevier in 2004. And, what, and his eigenvarieties are for eigenforms for definite unitary groups. And so I just wanted to start by uh, talking a little more in detail about what this eigenvariety looks like of Genevieve's. And then I wanted to uh, state a structure theorem about the points on this eigenvariety uh, and then talk a little bit about the proof. So start by looking at these eigenvarieties for definite unitary groups. So to start by being very specific about what kind of group we're looking at, uh, let P be an odd prime. This is just for notational convenience. And let G be an algebraic group over Q. Um, and I want G to, if you look at the real points, I want it to just be the uh, real unitary group. Um, but I want G to split at P. Uh, so I want G of QP to be isomorphic to GLN of QP. And so we start with a group like this. And what I want to do is define uh, the space of automorphic forms on G of a given, well, an automorphic form generally has a weight and a level. So the level should be a compact open subgroup U. Uh, 
of g of the finite Adele's over q. And the weight I want to be a character of the diagonal torus um, in g of qp, um, let's say with coefficients in cp. And also, uh, so tcp, of course, in this case, is just cp cross to n. And I want to specify that this weight should be uh, trivial trivial on the last copy of ZP cross. And I just say this because uh, if you have any weight, you can twist it by a central character to get one that is trivial on the last factor of ZP cross. Uh, and and like twist by central characters don't really affect our spaces of automorphic forms. Um, so I'm just specifying this so we don't have to keep track of extra information that we don't need. So. I wanted to define the space of automorphic forms of this given level and weight. So, and I'll and I'll call this space uh, S W of G comma U. And this is the space of functions from the G Q orbits of G of the finite Adels. Two, I'll write the continuous induction from the upper triangular Borel to the Iohori in G of QP. So this is the upper triangular mod P matrices of this character W. So this is functions from G of AF that are left invariant under GQ to this particular vector space, uh, satisfying the usual kind of invariance condition under U, which is that f of x u should be equal to up inverse times f of x for all uh, x in G of AF and u and u. OK, so this is my, or, or this is the definition of amorphic form that we're working with. It might look slightly non-standard. So, so I should say that if W is an algebraic character, meaning if it is a character, the form takes a matrix whose diagonal entries are d1 through dn uh, to uh, sorry to d1 to the t1. Oh um yeah I, I should probably specify that yes that up sure let's let's make up the Iowa you All right um right so so if w takes d1 through dn to d1 to t1 times d2 to the t2 times dot 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 dn minus 1 to the tn minus 1, um, where these uh, exponents t1 through tn minus 1 are non-increasing non-negative integers. So in this case, w is called algebraic. And in this case, uh, the space that we wrote down there will contain any other classical definition of uh, complex valued automorphic forms that you might have seen. Uh, if you if you fix some isomorphism between QP bar and C, and so so this containment, of course, uh, this space that I wrote here is very infinite dimensional, um, and generally, classical space of complex value automorphic forms would be finite dimensional. So this is contained as a very small subset.
Um, uh, so, well, I, I don't want to like work through all of it on the board, but just like, I mean, basically inside this, you have like the, uh, the algebraic representation of high w, w is algebraic. Um, and then, and so then if you put like sort of algebraic there instead of continuous, um, then you can like uh, sort of dualize and uh, dualize and like put the uh, target on the other side. And then if you, uh, and then if you just plug in like some like algebraic manipulations, uh, then, then you'll get classical space. So I should say that this only works because uh, G is compact at infinity. Um, because, uh, uh, right, as, as a result, like G of Q is discrete in G of AF, and it turns out that it makes sense to, like if you do that procedure, uh, you, you will get back your space of classical automorphic forms. Um, but uh, if, for example, G satisfied strong approximation, and G of Q, then G of Q would be dense in G of AF, and uh, you couldn't write down anything like this. And uh, I, mean, I mean, then like, there would be no non-trivial continuous functions on, uh, on the GQ over its of G of AF, and, and you would not be able to write down this like, non-standard definition. Um, so because G is compact at infinity, we can do this. And then next what we want to do is, well, when we have spaces of automorphic forms, um, we want to have HECA operators acting on them. So there's only one HECA operator that I want to talk about today. It's called UP. And it acts on the space SW G comma U. And the action to be described in kind of vague terms is, uh, well, HECA operators generally are like averaging operators. Uh, so this is, the, this is an average of right translations over a certain double coset of U. And I'll just write it down. It's the double coset associated to the matrix whose diagonal entries are p to the n minus 1, p to the n minus 2, dot, 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 1. So it's some averaging operator. And the special thing about this particular HECA operator is that it is completely continuous, also known as compact, meaning that it is the limit of a sequence of finite dimensional, uh, of operators with finite dimensional images. And that's nice because normally you might worry that that everything is infinite dimensional here, so it's not clear what parts of linear algebra work and don't work. Uh, but because UP is completely continuous, um, turns out it has a well-defined list of non-zero eigenvalues. And so then the eigenvariety is just going to be, uh, it's just going to keep track of these eigenvalues. So I can now write down exactly what the points on the eigenvariety will be. So we'll start with uh, the space of weights. So I'm going to call W the rigid space of all possible weights, so all possible uh, continuous characters uh, from TZP to CP cross. And so this thing really, it, it's very simple. It turns out to be a finite disjoint union of open unit polydisks of dimension n minus 1. And the reason for this is just, well, if you just look at uh, one of the factors, say if you, if you have a character from CP cross to CP cross, uh, such a character is going to be determined by 
a tame character, meaning a character of z mod pzp. And the value of the character on a topological generator of 1 plus pzp. OK? So it turns out that the value on the topological generator can be anything within an open unit disk. Or, yeah, open unit disk. And then you just have one disk for each tame character that you can have. And so that's our weight space. And then the eigenvariety, which I'll call z, is just the subset of w times gm, consisting of pairs w comma 1 over u, where u is an eigenvalue of up acting on, oh, uh, something I should say, I should have said here. Uh, I should not say that UP is completely continuous on uh, all of S sub U. Um, I probably only meant the locally analytic subspace here, uh, but that's a technical thing, never mind that. Um, right, so use an eigenvalue of UP acting on the say, locally analytic subspace of S sub U G comma U. So the reason I put 1 over u here is because we're ignoring the eigenvalues that are 0. And the reason we're ignoring the eigenvalues that are 0 is because we don't know how to, um, how to do this construction for uh, Hecke eigenforms that cannot be distinguished by their UP eigenvalues. Um, it'd be nice if we did, but uh, we're just focusing on um, the eigenvalues where UP is not 0 right now. And I should also say, of course, um, this eigenvariety uh, specifically only keeps track of UP eigenvalues. Um, you might want to instead keep track of entire systems of Hecke eigenvalues with like other Hecke operators. Um, and if you do want to do that, you can. Um, you can take like some cover of Z that will that will keep track of systems of eigenvalues. However, it'll it'll be the same at Z as Z at most points uh, and uh, the differences won't really affect what we're about to discuss anyway, so we'll just talk about Z. Okay, so now I can start going into details about the theorem that I wanted to talk about. So I want to start by stating this uh, folklore conjecture, uh, which sort of started with a question asked by Coleman and Mazur in their original 1998 paper. And then, and then was addressed by some computations of Buzzard and Kilford for, for the case P equals 2 in 2005. And I'm writing it down in the form uh, stated by Liu Wan Xiao. Uh, so the conjecture says that for the original coleman mazur eigencurve, so so this is a so so this is the eigencurve that parameterizes like p-adic modular Hecke eigenforms. Um, for this eigencurve, um, we have in this case. Uh, the situation is one dimensional, so W is just a union of P minus one open unit disks. Then the statement. is that if you take one of these p 
pianic open unit disks, and you put a coordinate on it. It's called a coordinate t. So maybe this is the weight uh, on the value of the weight on a topological generator, minus one or something. Then, if you look over the boundary of this disk, and by that I mean over the annulus where uh, the norm of t is between 1 and r, where r is sufficiently large, then it should be the case that our eigencurve z should decompose as an infinite disjoint union of pieces that are finite flat over weight space, um, such that on each piece, we have that the value. Yeah, uh, some yeah, some some number that's sufficiently close to one. Um, on each piece, the valuation of the UP eigenvalue is some constant times uh, the valuation of T. So, what is this actually saying from the perspective of? Uh, well, what is this really saying? Uh, so the valuation of the UP eigenvalue of a given automorphic form is called the form slope. So what this is telling you is as, well, as you get close to the boundary, uh, the norm of t goes to 1, so the valuation of t goes to 0. So what this is telling you is that, uh, is that the slopes of your forms are going to 0 as you walk toward the boundary. Uh, proportionately to your distance from the boundary. So you can see this as a, a statement about the sizes of the slopes. OK, so this conjecture was proven, sort of, by Leo Wan and Xiao in 2014, uh, but proven not for the original coleman mazur eigen, eigen curve uh, for piatic modular forms, but for but for definite quaternion algebras or equivalently uh, definite unitary groups. Of rank two. Sorry, could you maybe tell me how uh, how you could guess this is true, or, or why this conjecture was made? Uh, I think the conjecture was made because of the calculations, um, co computer calculations for p equals two. Uh, I am not sure whether there is a more uh, theoretical answer than that. Um, oh, I guess there there is something else which is like slightly related, which I'll, which I'll say later. Um, yeah, so, and the, and the way they proved this was by getting, oh yeah, so I should say, um, the, by Jacques Langlands, um, the Eigen curve for definite unitary groups of rank two is, um, is going to be a subset of the Eigen curve for piatic modular forms. Um, so, so this is like, uh, this does show the conjecture for some like large subset of the original Eigen curve but not quite all of it. And the way they did this was just by getting sufficiently strong bounds on the slopes that appear in the Eigen curve. And so I guess the question now is that what I want to talk about today is what if we have bigger n? bigger, higher rank definite unitary groups. So actually, there's a, uh, there's a comment in a 2015 paper of uh, 
of Andretta Iovina Poloni saying that as far as they knew in 2015, there were not even any conjectures about the slopes in, in higher dimensions. So that's what I want to talk about now. So again, we want to look at a single poly disk inside weight space and put some coordinates on it. Uh, let's call them t1 through tn minus 1. <coughs> And I'm going to encode the slopes in the eigenvariety over t1 through tn minus 1 in a Newton polygon. So I'll write np of t1 through tn minus 1 for the graph in the xy plane of this polygon who's such that if you look at the slope equals alpha segment of the polygon and you take its horizontal length, then this should be the number of up eigenvalues over the weight t1 through tn minus 1 of valuation alpha. Okay, And of course, the reason I'm drawing it this way is because this is secretly the Newton polygon of an actual power series. And we'll talk more about that later. But for now, it's just a convenient way of encoding the slopes that appear over a given point in the eigenvariety. <coughs> OK. So now I can state the theorem. So I want to give upper and lower bounds for the shape of that polygon. And fortunately, they'll look pretty similar. So start with the lower bound. Statement is that the Newton polygon at this weight lies above the curve in my, ax my axes are x and y. So that in the xy plane, the curve y equals some constant a1 times the minimum valuation among the ti's times x to the 1 plus 2 over n times n minus 1. Yes? So alpha is a real number? Uh, rational number. Yeah, the valuation of, yeah. Or the valuation of it. Just yes. Get from a yeah, there's numbers for it, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and then, what was I going to say? Uh, right. So, oh, so, so I should say this is for all, uh, for all TI such that, such that VTI is less than 1 over p. So this is kind of close to the boundary. And then the second part is the upper bound. So similarly, the union polygon lies below. Uh, so here I can't give a whole curve. Um, that can say infinitely many points on a curve of the form, uh, again, y equals another constant, a2, which is a bit bigger, times the maximum 
evaluation among the VTIs. This can be, this can be made a slightly smaller function, uh, but never mind that this is good enough. Times x to the, again, 1 plus 2 over n times n minus 1. And this, uh, I won't say exactly which TIs this holds for. Uh, I'll just say for many VTIs, or sorry, for many choices of TI. Um, and by many, I mean like piatically dense in some regions of the boundary. Okay, so basically what I'm saying here is just that the Newton polygon has exact polynomial growth rate x to the 1 plus 2 over n times n minus 1 with the coefficient depending on well, on the distance from the boundary, so on the sizes of the VTIs. OK? Um, all right, so that's the statement. Uh, there is a, at least one previous bound that I found in the literature. Uh, it's a lower bound um, from Chenevier's original paper in 2004. And it's a lower bound of x to the 1 plus 1 over 2 to the n minus n minus 1 um, in the center of weight space. Uh, so I guess it's interesting to note that it turns out the actual exponent is exponentially larger than that. Uh, and so what else did I want to say here? Oh, right, so I guess the other thing to note here is, well, uh, of course, Liu Wanxiao got this like really nice geometric consequence of, uh, of their bounds. So one might wonder, like, uh, in, in hard dimensions, we should also hope to have some geometric consequence. And so I can say something there, but, uh, it's not going to be as good. So what I can say is that if you're given a rational number, positive rational number alpha, which is a slope, and let's see. So, it, so if you look at certain regions of the boundary, um, so over, if you look specifically at the region where one of the VTIs is much smaller than uh, the other VTJs, and this much less than depends on alpha, uh, then you can say, that if you look at the subset of the eigenvariety where the evaluation of the UP eigenvalue is alpha times VTI, this is disconnected from its complement. So of course, the unfortunate thing about the statement is that, is that this region gets like smaller as alpha gets bigger. Uh, so I can't give you a single region over which, uh, over which the entire eigenvariety decomposes in this way, which Liu and Xiao are able to do uh, for rank two. And the reason for that is just because when n equals 2, uh, these upper and lower bounds actually match at some points. And so that gives you much more precise information about 
the geometry of the curve. So that's the statement. And now I wanted to talk a little, little bit about the proof. And we'll start with the proof of the lower bound, I guess, um, since it's very explicit and direct. So for the lower bound, uh, the basic idea is just we're interested in the eigenvalues of UP acting on the, say, the locally analytic subspace of SW of G comma U. Okay? So how do we get eigenvalues? Um, if this were a finite dimensional operator on a finite dimensional space, then we would just take the characteristic polynomial. Uh, but even though everything here is infinite dimensional, because UP is completely continuous, we can still just write down the determinant of I minus XUP. And this will be a power series in X instead of a polynomial. Uh, but it'll be an entire power series in X. And then the eigenvalues of UP will just be the inverses of the roots of this power series. So that means that if uh, this power series is written like out as like the sum of like CM times X to M, then the unipolygon is just going to be the lower convex hull of the points m comma v of cm in the plane. And so that means that if you want to get a lower bound on the shape of the Newton polygon, then all you have to do is get a lower bound on the evaluations of the coefficients of this power series. And you can get a lower bound on the valuations of the coefficients by getting a lower bound on the valuations of the matrix coefficients of UP. And so then, so then it's, a, it's an explicit calculation. You, just, you take a, a basis of SW, and you look at how UP is going to act on the basis. And you see that, and you will get a bound on the matrix coefficients. Uh, there is a technical difficulty here, which is that you need to do this uniformly over all of weight space or the, over the entire boundary. Um, but UP is not uniformly completely continuous over the entire boundary. Um, to, like, to like actually do the construction of the eigenvariety rigorously, you have to uh, restrict to an affinoid in weight space and look at UP there. And there are multiple ways to get around this technical issue. Uh, so Liu Wan and Xiao have this very clever series of elementary tricks. Uh, there's a more systematic method by, uh, I guess the, the history is that it was, a, it was first just suggested by Coleman that you can take weight space and like add a point um, that's like a point at the boundary. Um, and then you can extend, and then you should be able to extend the eigenvariety over the boundary, like to that point, um, and get a sort of like compactified eigenvariety. Um, and then you should be able to work over the point at the boundary. Um, and so this was first proven for the Coleman Mazur eigencurve by Andretta Iovita Piloni. Um, and then, and then Johansson and Newton in 2016 uh, did, did this extension of the eigenvariety to, the, to this uh, compactification of weight space uh, for, for more general eigenvarieties. And so, uh, and so basically, one, one way you can do this is apply the Johansson-Newton method uh, to the case of unitary groups.
Okay, so that's the lower bound, or that's, that's what I wanted to say about it. And so let's move on to the proof of the upper bound, which will take us a bit further afield. So we're now looking for a statement of the form the Newton polygon passes below in the plane a point of the form, well, some point, let's say x comma alpha x. Okay. So this would follow, for example, if we could establish that there are x linearly independent eigenforms. of slope at most alpha. Okay. So what we're really doing is we're looking for a bunch of eigenforms of small slope. So and then right, so how are we going to do that? Well, I said earlier that if w is an algebraic weight, then it, uh, then the spaces that we've been looking at contain like classical complex valued spaces of automorphic forms. So this is also true if W is what I'll call locally algebraic, meaning it's the product of an algebraic character and a finite character. Uh, so also in this case, The space S W G comma U contains uh, finite dimensional subspaces that can reasonably called be called classical subspaces. Okay. And now It is a general principle that if a classical form is finite slope, by finite slope, I mean that the valuation of the UP eigenvalue is finite. And by that, I mean that the UP eigenvalue is not 0. So just mean here if UPF is not 0, then the slope is pretty small. Uh, there's probably more than one way to prove this. But for example, we can prove it by constructing companion forms uh, for, for the classical forms. Uh, so like. So like if you have a classical automorphic form over a given weight, um, you can sort of permute the finite parts of the weight, and you'll get symmetric forms over, over those other weights. And then these will satisfy, their slopes will also satisfy some symmetry properties. Uh, in particular, they'll add up to a fixed number. And so that will, in particular, give you an upper bound on the slope of any one. Um, small just means, uh, well, in the, in the case of modular w forms of weight k, it should be uh, at most uh, either k minus 1 or k plus 1. Uh, I forget which. OK, so now we just want to look for a bunch of eigen, classical eigenforms such that u p of f is non-zero. OK, so I want to say that 
this statement that u p of f is not zero is like actually a representation theoretic statement. And the reason for this, so I guess I should say we're like trying to construct a large subspace. consisting of forms f such that up of f is not 0. So if f is a classical automorphic form, then you can associate to it an automorphic representation. Sure. I, by, by large, I just mean like big enough to give me my upper bound. Um, that right, but something must be going to infinity. It must be infinity. Yeah, it will. It will. It will get better. It will. It will get bigger as as the weights as the algebraic parts of the weight get bigger, and it will also get bigger as you get closer to boundary. So it, what is that? The classic. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so if you're given f, then you get an automorphic representation. Pi f. Uh, this is a representation of G of the Adels, which decomposes into a restricted tensor product of local components pi f l. Uh, so each of these is a smooth representation of G of Q l. And so I said that UP is an averaging operator. You can also think of it as a projection operator. And it projects onto the Jacquet module. So actually, UPF not being 0 turns out to be the same thing as saying that the local component at P, pi of P, is a principal series representation of GLN of QP. So that means that what we really want to do is classify principal series representations of GLN of QP. Or sorry, classify, yeah, classify automorphic representations whose local components at P are principal series representations. So how do we do that? So when n is 2, this was written down by Loeffler and Weinstein in 2011, for example. Um, and you, you can get statements like, for example, pi of p is a principal series if the level of f uh, equals the conductor of its central character. And you can get this just by brute force. Like, there are, I mean, uh, there are three types of smooth representations of GL2 of QP. There are principal series, uh, special, and supercustable representations. And the new vectors in each of those was written down by Castleman. And so you can just check the levels of all the new vectors, and you'll see that this is the, if you have the statement, then principal series is the only possibility. Um, when n is bigger than 2, you have a lot more Bernstein Zelovinsky classes, and probably you don't want to brute force through all of them. So we want to have a shortcut that Sorry? Uh, I'm, I'm a bit confused why you're classifying these. Um, you you want to show there are many Fs with that. Yeah. 
Yeah, by classify, I just mean, well, I mean, as, as it turns out, I, I do find all the principal series. But yeah, that was not like necessarily a thing that I had to do. Um, right, so, so when n is bigger than 2, we want a shortcut. And so we use Rocher's work on principal series types. So what Roche tells us is that if we have a character chi, uh, a smooth character, say with coefficients in C, um, then he constructs a finite index subgroup J of the Iwahori. And an extension of chi to j such that if you're given an irreducible representation pi, of GLN of QP, then this is a principal series associated to chi, uh, meaning that it's the induction from B to GLN of QP of, I guess, some extension of chi to T of QP. Um, this is true. If and only if pi contains a vector v on which j acts by chi. So this is just saying that we can detect whether pi is a principal series by just looking for a vector on which this big subgroup acts in some simple way. By a character. For most chi, this was done by how, actually. Was your how? Oh. Maybe okay. not like every single chi, but at least a generic quantity. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Right, I guess, right, I guess actually the Roche statement actually holds for like not just GLN, like uh, many other groups as well. Um, so I guess that's that's probably the like main advantage of it, but that's not actually relevant for us. Um, all right, so what we're saying here is that we need a large subspace. Uh, which I'll call S of forms um, such that pi fp contains a, a vector of this form. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll call vectors like this j chi vectors. So how are we going to get the subspace? Uh, so actually, I was talking to Jessica Finson, and she suggested that uh, there, there might actually be an improvement to what I'm about to say. Um, but I haven't quite made it work yet. And what I'm about to say is I, I'm more confident that it's correct. So I'm just going to say it. Um, so what we can do is we first prove that the Induction from J to the Wahori of chi is irreducible. So J being finite index in the Iwahori, um, this is just a finite dimensional representation of finite groups. So we use can use finite finite group representation theory on it. Um, there are 
pretty large finite groups, but it still works out eventually. And then once you assume that it's irreducible, if you go back and look at the, uh, the definition of a space of automorphic forms that I wrote down at the beginning, uh, and like there was an induction in there. So if you just sort of plug this in there and like tensor with some algebraic part, uh, you can directly construct a subspace S of forms such that pi of p admits a non-trivial map from this induction. So evidently, for f of that form, uh, pi of p will contain a j chi vector, so we force the two, and so will be a principal series. So so then we just need to uh, estimate the size of s. And so that just takes a little bit of combinatorics. Um, and that gives you the upper bound uh, on the, 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 the point that the Newton polygon has to pass below. And so the last thing I wanted to say here is just, I had, as mentioned earlier, uh, we can actually prove that S is actually, this S we constructed here um, is the entire space of automorphic forms uh, associated to principal, local principal series representations. And the reason for that is just, um, in some sense, S is the space of forms of minimal level uh, possible for the given weight. Um, and, uh, and so in, in general, that, that will be like the space of principal series automorphic representations. Um, so we need to do a little bit of work uh, fiddling with the construction of the eigenvariety to like precisely say that S is the space of forms of minimal level. Um, but that can be done. And that is all I wanted to say. <laughs>